everybody, and welcome to another exciting hair raising fun filled episode of Radio Rama, where I show you, as the name implies, how to work on radios. Not just radios, but sometimes televisions, record players, a lot of stuff out there. Anything that basically runs on vacuum tubes, that's my favorite thing. And today we have a model. I, I didn't bother to look, but it doesn't really matter. This is a very common General Electric radio. They made these by the trillions. I've probably worked in this model at least 10 times. I haven't seen this much of uh, this white color though. Usually they're in Bakelite. And this is Plascoon, I believe. I don't know what the situation is as far as it's working or not. I do know these come with a Christmas light bulb for the illumination. Yep, there it is, it's on. I'm gonna be steady at the helm just in case I can see if it's gonna make a loud buzzing noise, which it might. Should be coming up by now. And it ain't. Okay, I hear a little crackling. Well, that's awful quiet. So, either the electrolytics are gone to kablooey, or we've got a burnt open resistor, or we have a bad tube, or something else. But we will find out sooner than later because we're going to take it apart and see what's going on. Well, regardless of the mistake, this tube is compatible with a 12 SQ7, as is this one. Compatible being a loose word. I would replace them with the correct tubes because sometimes you can either lose or degrade your your reception with the wrong tubes, even though they're claimed to be compatible. It's been my experience anyway. So I'm just trying to grab the old trusty tube tester and do some tube testing. Okay, well I tested all the tubes and they tested just fine, so there's nothing wrong there. Probably going to be something underneath. So let's let's detach that speaker, remove the chassis, and take a look underneath. I wonder if it's going to be factory original. All right, so I yanked it out of the chassis. Chassis. I want to get those two confused. Cabinet. And this has been worked on. This is a non-original electrolytic. You can see where we have the old, well basically the old, whatever you call it, friction clip for holding the original in. And they've replaced it with this Sangamo brand electrolytic. And by the looks of it, it's also quite aged. You can see where some of the electrolyte is starting to bulge out of the side here. It's bad. So, bare minimum, we need to replace this. We also need to replace the rest of these wax capacitors. And the most important cap in here is this guy. That's going to chassis ground, this guy. It's a big no-no. Essentially, this tenth of a microfarad is way, way higher than would pass today's safety standards, meaning if you were to touch this and ground at the same time, you might get a little bit of a jolt. The reason I say that is because these are, as I've mentioned earlier, these are called floating hot chassis sets where you have one end of the power cord making its way to the chassis, but in this case through a cap, this guy. That's to reduce the amount of total current that could get to you. I'm also noticing here this, uh, it's unusual to see these caps budge, bulging out a little bit. That looks incinerated. That's probably also a problem. So it's time to get cracking. We have two electrolytics in here. They're probably 40 microfarad caps, which is fine. And then I want to replace this one, and we're going to replace that with, of course I lost it already, this guy. Let's say X2, Y2 created, rated across the line cap. That'll replace this guy to reduce the amount of current by a factor of 10, because this is a 0 0.01 rated microfarad cap. And uh, then we'll replace this weird deformed cap, and we'll give it a swing again to see if we get any action out of it. Okay, so now let's get to replacing the electrolytics that are in here. And sometimes you just have to be clever. You have to figure out where is the most opportune place to put your new, much smaller electrolytics. And so generally what I do is I just kind of trace where the leads go, and we have this negative here, and the two positives. 
And what I can do is twist the negatives of these two guys together, see, and stick the negatives here collectively and then run the positive wires, which is this wire and this wire down here, which is hard to see. You can just jumper them over to the two positives. It'll stick out through the top. So let's go ahead and do that, and uh, then we'll give it a test to see if that's restored anything. I've noticed there's something hokey going on right here. Something has been added here. And I don't see any wire that's coming off of one of the IF cans. Oh well, we'll see if that makes a difference. Anyway, need to replace these two guys and definitely this guy that is looks very much hosed. And then we'll see if we have radioage. Okay, so I've done the bare minimum. Replaced the two electrolytics and that one cap that was bulging and bursting at the end. So I'm going to go ahead and try it out. I'm going to put it on my Variac, not my Variac, my isolation transformer. It's down here. They were plugged in. Okay, do we have power? We should. I can't hardly tell here. Maybe it'd help if I flipped it over the right way. Okay, it's on now. Even though I can't assume anything because that. Christmas light is on a separate, separate circuit. Okay, I do see filament, good. Zilch. No reception. Well, it's time to start doing some basics, like measuring B+. Plus. B+, plus is good. Get about 130 on that one. 103 on that one. That's probably a little bit low, but it should still kind of work. Um... I'm trying to remember, did I test the tubes on this? It's been like two or three weeks since I worked on this thing. So let me go back and watch my videos, see if I did. Ran some basic diagnostics and there's nothing that I see that could be, at least from some initial measurements, causing an issue. But I was looking down here and we have another cap. You see that crack there? That's hard to tell. It's like that disc right here. The ends are breaking off of that, and I looked at the other one that was like this. You can see, like, it just complete failure, and that looks like a coupling cap between the output tube and 12SQ7. So that would definitely kill audio for sure. I'm not sure about radio reception. I get a feeling something must have catastrophically happened to cause a number of these caps to go AWOL. So I'm going to replace a few at a time and test as I go to see if I have any sort of recovery. And, uh, you know, I think the crucial th most of the time that I've measured these caps, they're hilariously off. Like they've leaked so much, it's amazing that they capacitate anymore. So, yes, it it's, goes without saying these caps can cause a lot of performance issues. So I'm not going to shotgun the whole thing, but I'm going to definitely try to see if I can improve things a little bit by digging a little deeper. All right, so when I pulled that weird cap out of there, the end came off. Completely separated. So, a little bit of a tight chassis here. Let me hook things up and see if we get any kind of life out of it. Okay, there is some improvement. Audio is improved. I get a feeling there's just a bunch of really messed up caps in this thing, so I'll, I need to replace the rest of those capacitors before I do anything else. All right, welcome to the next day of working on the General Electric. And as we dropped off last night, I replaced a few caps and got better audio, but still no radio reception. What I'm actually going to do is I'm going to take out my cap checker. I'm curious. 
what these guys are measuring. This is the to the ground cap. This is critical. It's too big of a value, probably. Tenth of a microfarad. That should be 0 0.01 microfarads instead. And it should be a different kind of capacitor. Namely, it should be one of these guys. X2, Y2 across the line rated cap. Guaranteed to split open if it's, well, if it gets zapped, it'll split open versus shorting, which would be catastrophic. I wonder if my caps tester is still charged up. Let's test some caps here. Well, look like all these were still measuring some level of capacitance, but this one right here is measuring as a, well, crap, it went offline. Uh, it's measuring as a resistor. So that's no good. Not sure if that's the problem, but that certainly wouldn't work right if your capacitor is measuring as a resistor. That means it's resisting, whatever that means. Okay, it's still not working, so there's still a major problem going on. I'm still a little suspicious about the weird tubes that whoever owned this before put in there. Let me dig through my supply, see if I have the tubes that the set actually calls for. Even though it did say that there was some compatibility, that doesn't mean that the compatibility will cause the radio to work either. Okay, I think I found the problem is actually the antenna. I think there's a break in the antenna somewhere. So we get reception. I don't want to get anywhere near this thing. Luckily, I think I have a spare of this antenna sitting around, so let me go dig it up. Okay, well, I have this extra antenna, but it doesn't make a difference. It's really strange. It's like the radio is there. Just out of curiosity, let me tweak this guy a little bit. Doesn't do anything. <sighs> I don't have this tube. They've substituted some weird tube in here. It's supposed to be a 12S G7, and they've got a 12S. H7. Let me double check the tube book and see what the compatibility is. Okay, it says you can substitute, but they both have completely different shutoff characteristics, so that could be messing up with my my chassis here. It's freaking annoying that I don't have these tubes. Let me dig through my tubes just one more time. I want to confirm it's not the tube that's causing this problem, because it's, it's almost there. Like, the radio is there. It's just not coming through. It's not really translating through the way it should be. I know it's like very non-technical language there, but I can't help but think that this set probably worked for a while with this tube in it. There's no reason why it shouldn't be working now. I'm going to take a look underneath as well. I might even bring the spare. Uh, I have a second one of these radios that's sitting in the closet. Maybe I'll drag it out and see if there's any inconsistencies with the uh, location of components. All right, so it seems to be working a little better now. It's a little quiet. I think it needs to... Have a little bit of a tune-up here. Let's see. You're being protected when uh, officers make mistakes and it's clear mistakes. But it would show a sign of... Um, I, I don't know. He should be in the And on the brown side, Nick Chubb is the obvious choice. He's the number one running back in fantasy football right now. And Kareem Hunt is also a nice flex option. Keep this in mind, I mean, the Steelers have been awful against the run uh, over the last year plus. Getting back to last season, they have been very vulnerable to running back. How could this have been that off? Jesus, this was out of alignment. He had a big game last week after a stinker in week one. I think he is on the borderline of being a flex starter. And I mentioned the Browns' defense. You can go ahead and start them in this contest as well. When you look at the Browns and you start thinking about Jacoby Brissett as their quarterback, i got to imagine that that does have an effect on a lot of the things you're saying. Yeah, it does. And we have two... And I'm going to raise you to act like... ...center for the Steelers. For when news breaks... Hey, black man. John Smith on KGO 810. eBay's Performance Marketing Incorporated, DBA Rackets and Rewards, is hiring QA Automation Engine.
That's working a lot better. Someone must have just really screwed the screws in all the way on those trimmers. Not trimmers, but those, those transformers. That was like 90% off. It was barely alive. All right, so the next thing, since we've gotten the radio working, and I'm kind of, I don't know, usually these days I can stand about two hours working on the electronics part, and then I switch gears. So now I'm going to do some cosmetic things. I'm going to clean the chassis. I know it's not really necessary. Might as well. 75-year-old piece of equipment. And then I'm going to lubricate the tuning mechanism, clean these fins out because it's got some debris in there. And then we'll lubricate some of the other stuff here. Someone wrapped a rubber band around that for some reason. Clearly it's not needed. Anything that moves will need to clean it up. Change that light bulb out. These little C7 Christmas lights don't last hardly at all. So I'm going to put a different candelabra base in there. Or a candelabra, candelabra bulb in there. That'll last a lot longer. How's this cord? Surprisingly good shape. I think that's the original cord that came on it, but it's real supple. It's not cracking or anything, so I think it's fine. All right, let's get the business of cleaning this thing up. All right, so I cleaned it up a little bit. There's a lot of, I don't know, patina on this chassis. It's not perfect, but whatever. I just want to get the grime off. So we're going to oil these bearings up here. There's some bearings in the tuning condenser in the front and the back. This makes for better contact and makes it also... There's one in the middle here too. This makes things move a lot easier. Feels better for the end user. Likewise, we're gonna put a little bit here. And already just that little amount makes things just move so much smoother. Likewise, I'm gonna get a little bit on the inside here. And then this guy is coming through the chassis, let's get a little oil on that. I'm using Zoom Spout Oil. I'm not sure where that name comes from, but it sure works good. Penetrates things a little bit better than 3-in-1 for sure. Alright, that feels a lot better. That too is feeling a lot better. It's like butter. So now that we have the basic electronics in good functioning order, I'm going to go over to the case. And I want to say something important about this case because for whatever reason, the ink that General Electric used on this model, let me just say this out, you know, outright. If you try to clean the inside of that glass, you'll take the numbers right off. Don't even try. It's fine that it, the window's not perfectly clear. It's much worse if you wipe those numbers off. I learned that the hard way when I was a kid. I've got one of these things and I eagerly clean the inside of the glass and those numbers, it comes off like chalk. So don't touch it. This case is pretty dirty. It's got some uh, stuff going on in the cracks here. I don't really want to take the glass out because it's held in with these stupid clips and plus I'm afraid I'll just like remove some of the ink so I'm just gonna leave everything in there and I think what I'm gonna do is get my toothbrush out and some cleaner and just start going into these crevices to get some of that grime out of there then we're gonna go after this with some car nuba car wax to bring back some of the shine and luster all right so it's time to do a little cleaning looked in my toolbox and luckily I have quite a few old toothbrushes in there we're just going to go in here in these little cracks and clean the gunk out of there. And take your time because the thing is, is that details are what matter. You're going to have a radio and you're going to try to get the most interest for it. People, people will pay attention to these little details like whether or not there's grime or crap that's built up inside the little cracks. But overall, you know, big picture, it's going to look a lot better when everything's completely cleaned up and uniform. Now what I'll do is I'll get a, uh, a rag and wipe that gunk out of there. But you see how disgusting that is? Let's see what it looks like when I take the, the gunk away. 
Now granted, that needs more work, but that's a lot better than it did look. We're gonna do the whole thing to everything on this case here, all these little nooks and crannies. Do a real clean, thorough, deep clean job. All right, so I cleaned up the cabinet. I did discover the print for some reason on this one was in good shape. So I was able to clean the inside and outside of the glass. That's gonna look a lot better. Now let's direct our attention back to the chassis. What I need to do is test the set to see if it meets our safety criteria. And even what, what we have found is that a lot of this, this, this era of, of AA5, even though this is actually, this is an AA6, which is even more of a challenge. In this period, for some reason, a lot of the manufacturers would ground the grids on some of the IF and RF tubes. So we have a ground on pin number one of 12SA7, and there's probably grounds on the others. Yeah, there's one off of the 12S, what is that one? I think that's the 12SQ7. And there's probably one for 12SK7, even though I don't see one, maybe not. But what we have found is that you can, uh, the metal tubes for some reason will cause the set to fail its um, current test on the chassis. What I mean by that is I'm going to measure how much current is getting to this chassis. We have uh, removed most of the threat of shock potential by installing this 0 .01 rated cap to the chassis ground. And what I've done is I've replaced the two uh, metal tubes that I think are problematic, in particular 12SA7, with a glass tube. Sometimes they'll pass and all you have to do is that alone. If it's not, we're going to have to start snipping some of those leads and install uh, a cap sometimes. Well, we might have to install a cap because sometimes the set will refuse to work after you snip uh, the grid ground to your chassis. Well, lo and behold, that did work. Uh, on my multimeter here, my scale is basically 2 volts AC. I'm feeding this in through a a polarity reversing device. Basically the calibrated output of this device is 250 volts millivolts AC and this is my little wand. I'm not a mathematician but we did the configuration that 0 0.6 tenths of a volt on this scale is the max and we're getting 0.37. That's a little over halfway there so this is a much safer chassis now. So I don't recommend anyone do this, but if someone were to touch this and ground, they might get a little bit of a buzz, but it's not going to be, you know, full on electrocution with all the juice that could possibly come out of the outlet whacking you. It's because we've squeezed, the, think of it like a fire hose. Now we have a fire hose coming in, but then we're squeezing that water through this tiny little cap. That's going to slow that fire hose down to a teeny little trickle. So now that we've done that, we've gotten the uh, set rebuilt and working and safe. It's time to add the audio input feature so that the future owner can listen to their music and not just AM radio, which let's face it, unless you like talk radio, not much to listen to, especially not music. Okay, now it's time to install the audio input feature. The first thing that you need to do is determine which lead on which side of the volume pot is the incoming radio signal. It wasn't hard to kind of figure this one out because all of these guys are going to the floating chassis ground. And so by default, this is the radio signal. I tried it out too. I plugged it in. If you don't hear any radio, that means you've effectively disconnected the radio. But we want to have the ability for the user to be able to turn that back off and on. So we're going to run a little wire from these two connection points at the back and there'll be a little switch. Where's my switch? There it is, a little switch. And we're gonna run that through a really skinny little wire. There's like basically no current on that so you can just use like this super thin stuff. And then what we're gonna do is install a isolation transformer between the volume pot and the incoming audio cable. And it does exactly what it says, which is it isolates the user from potential dangerous electric current, even though there's really nothing dangerous on there right now. 
it's just good insurance. We do it anyway. You can also improve the sound quality of the incoming audio by running through one of these guys. And I've mentioned this in all my videos because a lot of people ask, where do you get them? I have to order them from Alibaba at a hundred at a time. And I know most of you are not restoring hundreds of radios like I do. So if you don't want to do that, what you can do is get the wall wart. I know a bunch of you probably are like me and have a giant massive ball of wire somewhere, which is probably intermingled and mixed up with wall warts. So if you find a wall wart that has 120 going in, if you're in Europe or elsewhere, 220 in, and then either 12 or 6 volts comes out the other, that's what you want to use. That's fine. Just crack it open. It's, they're a little bit bigger than this, but it'll still work. And so we have a primary side. The primary is where the incoming juice would have come, 120 volts in this case. Out is 12 volts. And what we're going to do is this, I know it's going to seem backwards, is this is going to essentially feed into either side of the volume pot here. You see we have three leads in the center. So we have a top and the bottom of the pot. The pot, uh, the top of it is the radio signal side. So we want to run our incoming audio through here so that the volume control can do its job, which is turn the volume up and down. And then on the other side, we have our secondary, which is the low voltage side. Incoming will be the audio cable. And here we have a little, well, that's the cut end. Where is it? There it is. That. And of course, it's a stereo cable, so it has a right and left channel. You don't want to just twist the ends together. That's, that's a great way to damage your, your input device. So what we're going to do is we're going to get these two 33 ohm resistors. And the right and left channels will go... Quit being a pain. Right and left channels will go in through these two leads, and then the other two are twisted together. And then you can run that to your positive and that will be your true combined mono. The other thing that's crucial here is these sets from this era, probably starting in the 30s, mid 30s through um, you know 50s, 60s, whatever, these sets would come with an automatic gain control feature. And we found that putting this in circuit by itself was causing the automatic gain control feature to go crazy and make the radio uh, reception sound really wonky and off. So to shunt that, we're going to put in a resistor in series with a 0 0.02 rated cap. This is a resistor that is half the value of the resistance of the volume pot. I find, generically speaking, that 270K ohm resistors will work. That's going to be on the primary side. And th these two will be together before it gets to the top of the volume pot. Again, the positive radio incoming signal area. Then the other side just goes to the other side of the pot. You can even go to chassis ground if you if you want. It doesn't matter because this is going to do all of the protecting. Lastly, you want to find a place to put it that is as close to the volume control as possible. So I find it will go just fine right here. You want to clean this up with alcohol and roughen it up with some sandpaper. You want to roughen this up too. And then I use a, I like this Gorilla Super Glue Gel. I don't know why it seems just like it works wonders and that'll cement that down rock hard onto that surface so i know it's a lot to take in but i will go ahead and manufacture that and install it and we can take a look at it when it's assembled all right so i wanted to make a little bit of a point i find it's easier to manufacture these outside of the case it's just easier instead of having i used to do it in here after i'd glued it in it was just some pain so there we go we got a right and left channels tied together and then we have our resistor and cap for the top of the pot, and then we have our negative for the other side of the pot. So I will glue it in, and then it's time to figure out where I'm going to route the plumbing for the rest of the stuff. I think I've got a hole drilled here already. I will just um, run the audio cable through that. Okay, so here we have the system installed. We have the isolation transformer that's then in turn running to either side of the volume pot here and then we have we haven't installed the switch wire yet and then we have the, um, the resistor and the cap going to the top of the volume pot what I've also been doing lately I put these rubber what do you call them grommets through the holes that I run things through that way it's not going to chafe or anything so I've got my Bluetooth running through it now so 
So that's that's not going to sound that good because I've got a much mass, much bigger speaker. <laughs> but anyway, um, it seems to be working quite well, so it's time to run the switch wire out and test that. And then I think we might be able to put this back in the case and call it done. Hooray! Okay, so it's done. Got my audio running through it. So, if I want to listen to the radio, just guess disconnect this little guy here, little switch in the back, and we got radio! Against her. She, as well as comedian Ari Spears, quiet in pain. You're a court judge. A very long time to the point where we're like... This has got like really sensitive, well, it's a six tube radio, of course it's more sensitive. Anyway, I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. It's just a good looking radio. I've worked on a lot of the Bakelite. I haven't worked on a Plascon or whatever this is version of this. So this is unusual for me. And I'm glad I did it. All right, guys, thanks so much for watching. If you have any questions or comments, you can leave them down in the comment section. I'll try to get to it the best I can. And uh, until the next time something comes across the workbench, see you guys next time. Adios.